If you're an avid football fan, you've probably collected and read just about everything you can find about your favorite team. The daily sports pages, magazine articles, and even the profiles and statistics inside the program. Or if you love cooking, you've probably read everything from recipe books to the food section of the local paper to gourmet magazines. In either case, you find some information more useful than others. You might be interested in one or two particular players with your favorite team. Or you might enjoy making desserts more than preparing main dishes. So even though you might read any article you can find on the topic, not all of them will be equally informative or valuable to you. That's research in a nutshell. Despite the fact that we seem to cringe when we hear the word research, it's really not any different from the approach we take all the time in learning more about the things we're really interested in. Since it's hard to tell from the beginning of a research project exactly what material you will include in your final paper, you will need to read through all the resources you've collected on your subject and jot down the main ideas in each so you can remember and prioritize them later on. This is step five in the process, taking notes. Whatever your thesis, the proof of your argument will depend heavily on the strength of your research, on how thoroughly you collect your information, and how well you use that information to build your argument. Therefore, it is important to learn how to judge and evaluate your sources, and how to use them effectively. After you've prepared your preliminary bibliography, Skim through your resources to find relevant material for your notes. As you skim, evaluate the author's purpose in light of your own purpose. Does the thesis support or aid your own? See if you can find examples or data in the article to back up your own main points. There are three basic rules that you can follow in order to judge the quality of a source and its benefit to you. They are the three R's of evaluating research material. Relevance, recency, and ranking. Relevance. The best sources for you will be the ones that are the most closely related to your thesis. Check the preface, the table of contents, and possibly the index to assess just how valuable it will be for you. Or skim the article to be sure it touches on the points that you will be making in your paper. Suppose your thesis is about the long-term effects of divorce on children. Obviously, an article on how to find a good divorce lawyer is not relevant to your thesis. However, if you find an article which states that divorcing parents are often too caught up in their own problems to notice what's happening with their children, then you have an article which gives you good information for your argument. Recency. Unless you are working on some sort of historical project, you should use the most current material available. Check the publication date of the book or textbook you're using. Obviously, you don't want to draw conclusions on outdated material. Let's say you're writing about abortion. You definitely don't want to use anything written before 1973 when the Roe versus Wade decision made abortion legal. In order to be sure you are working with the latest information, refer to magazine and journal articles on the subject first. In addition to being more up-to-date, articles are usually shorter and more direct than books. If, however, you want to make comparisons before and after abortion was legalized, then, of course, you would look at resources written in the 50s and 60s, as well as the most current articles. Ranking. This is the most intuitive aspect of judging a source. When you rank a source, you must determine whether it will provide a general overview of the subject or whether it is specialized in a way that will be helpful to your thesis. You may have to evaluate and rank a source on its technical level, for example. It is not always true that the more technical an article or book, the better it is as a source. In fact, the book may be so technical that it bogs you down with facts which you don't need to know. It's important to remember that not all sources are equal. People who write materials have their own and different perspectives. Some may be better authorities on the subject than others. 
Some may have relied more on opinion than fact, or they may have had different purposes when they wrote their work. For example, suppose you're writing an essay about air pollution. Which source do you think is more reliable and accurate? A pamphlet about the industry's role in providing clean air, or a newspaper article explaining why it's so hard to enforce pollution laws. Both topics are relevant to your thesis, and certainly either one can provide the kind of information you're looking for. Just because a pamphlet is briefer than an article doesn't mean it won't contain valuable information. But suppose that on closer examination, you discover that the pamphlet was written by one of your town's major polluters, while the other piece was written by a newspaper reporter. Now you will probably conclude that the newspaper's story gives a fairer and more accurate picture of the situation. The industry which pollutes will obviously be more concerned with convincing the reader that cleaning up the air is costly and difficult to accomplish. The information does not come from as reliable a source as the newspaper. So judging your resource materials is an important part of the process of collecting information. As you examine each source on your preliminary bibliography, use the three R's to help determine how valuable this information is. If a book or article passes the test, you are ready for the next step in writing a research paper, taking notes. The best way to take notes is on index cards. Here are a few tips which will make note taking easier. Allow one idea per card. This gives you the flexibility to rearrange the card several times in any order you choose, so you can organize your thoughts after you've collected all the raw data. Write on one side only. Obviously, it is easy to overlook material entered on the back. Always list the source. While you don't have to write a complete bibliography each time, you do need to know where the quote or the concept came from in case you need to credit or cite it, or if you want to go back and reread the original article in order to flesh out your point. Be sure your heading references match the corresponding bibliography card. Use consistent labels for cards. Use headings that relate to your outline. Write a full note so you will be able to understand what you wrote weeks later. Do not throw anything away. You will not know what you might need until you have completed the final draft, so it is best to keep everything until the paper is written. At the beginning of each note-taking session, have your working bibliography cards handy. Read over your notes from the previous session. This will help you see what topics and subtopics may need further development. It also gets your mind in gear. As you start your note-taking, head each note card with the author's last name so you can always reference it immediately, as well as any key words which will help you remember the aspect of the book that is your interest. When you take notes on the content of each article or book, decide which items you want to quote directly and which ones you will either paraphrase, summarize, or write down key phrases for. The direct quotation is just that. Write down exactly what is written in the text. The only real reason for ever using a direct quotation is that the writer has expressed an idea so perfectly that you cannot improve on it or condense it without destroying its meaning. Direct quotations can often serve to highlight your paper. They can also give credibility to your own ideas or add emotion as well as logic to an argument. Consider this example. At the first International Liberators Conference, liberators and survivors of the Nazi death camps met again, brought together by the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. The testimony of liberators and survivors would serve as a warning that we must not allow the genocide of any people to happen again. Now listen to the impact of quoting someone directly. The train arrived to a place which appeared to me as a big farm. So I was to some extent, I was satisfied because that was the work I knew well.
I was told from, from others who were working there, from the slave la la uh, laborers, that we were in an extermination camp called Treblinka, and all, uh, that all people who came with me and went, uh, and went to the bus were dead already. You can see how using a first-hand quote can often be more compelling than trying to rephrase the idea yourself. However, too many quotes can take over and can diminish the strength of your thesis. Too many quotes may make your paper appear to be unfocused. It will seem as if you do not have a clear grasp of the thesis and are just clutching at anything available. Direct quotes, then, should not dominate your paper. So when you're taking notes and you discover a quotable quote you think you might use later in your essay, be sure to copy it word for word and to cite the author and source in which you found the quote. The paraphrase is the next form of note-taking. When you paraphrase what an author says, you put the author's ideas into your own words. This is the most important kind of note-taking skill you can have for two reasons. Not only is this the most frequently used note-taking form, but it also can form the basis of the first draft of your essay. Since paraphrasing ideas means you are writing in your own style, well-written paraphrases can be strung together later on when you actually write the paper. The second reason the paraphrase is important is because it can help you learn to think critically about your topic. In order to paraphrase someone else's thoughts, you need to fully understand the concept or argument you're rewording. Avoid changing the meaning of what the other person is saying by injecting your own comments or reactions on the subject. Later, as you write the paper, it will be difficult to tell the documented source material from your own. To get an idea of how good paraphrasing works, listen to what this person is saying and see if you can translate the ideas into your own words. All three of these surfaces are tied into a digital computer and their deflection or movement during flight is optimized by the flight control computers. When the pilot makes a stick input to the airplane, these three surfaces all re react simultaneously to give the optimum response to the airplane to minimize drag and maximize performance. Let's play the tape again and think about what this person said. All three of these surfaces are tied into a digital computer and their deflection or movement during flight is optimized by the flight control computers. When the pilot makes a stick input to the airplane, these three surfaces all re react simultaneously to give the optimum response to the airplane to minimize drag and maximize performance. That was the program manager for the X-29 aircraft NASA's testing. Of course, the language is complex and the concept difficult, but it can be paraphrased. Something like, digital computers connected to the surface of the airplane wings monitor their movement and provide this information to the pilot. This allows the pilot to make immediate adjustments and helps improve the plane's performance. Depending upon the complexity and the detail you want in your paper, your paraphrase may be simpler or more complex. Likewise, if you're paraphrasing something you read rather than something you heard, your note card might look like this. When you have completely written a paraphrase, be sure to double check the source to see if you have included all the necessary information, that you have stated the meaning completely in your own words, that you have not included your own comments or reactions, and that you have recorded any information necessary to document the source for your bibliography or list of references. The third method of note-taking is summarizing. Summarizing is much like paraphrasing, only more limited in scope. Here you merely extract significant facts by focusing only on the essentials, not the details. You might condense an entire paragraph to one sentence. For example, computers connected to the wings help the pilot improve the performance of airplanes. 
When you summarize, you want only the gist of what's said, rather than the expression or tone of the work. Often you can find the information for a summary in the introduction or first chapter of a book. Finally, the last type of note-taking is called key term notes. That is, you write down only key phrases and words which give you a shorthand version of the information. For example, flight control computers, optimum response, minimize drag, maximize performance. Now you have four methods of taking notes. Direct quotes, paraphrase, summarizing, and key terms. A word of warning. Be very careful about getting quotation marks and sources on your note cards. Otherwise, you may fall into careless or unintentional plagiarism. Plagiarism is using someone else's words or ideas without giving proper credit. It is wrong to plagiarize, whether it is done deliberately or through carelessness. Both print and non-print materials are protected by copyright. No college or university will tolerate plagiarism and most instructors will fail students who practice it. You may find that a source you want to use has stated an idea so well you can't imagine saying the same thing any other way. It's tempting to record those words on a note card. If you do, don't forget the quotation marks and don't forget to record the source and page number. That way you can give proper credit later as you write your paper. It is also very easy to slip into plagiarism when you paraphrase. Instead of condensing original material, you're recasting it into your own words while keeping most of the information intact. When you come across a passage you want to paraphrase, read it over until you are sure of its meaning. Then put the passage away so that you cannot refer to it. Now write your version of the passage. If you follow this simple suggestion, you can be fairly sure your paraphrase is not plagiarized. As you read through your resource material and take notes, you'll need to distinguish between fact and opinion. Just because a statement is in print doesn't mean it's a fact. A fact is information which can be documented. In 1989, more than 4,000 people in the United States died of AIDS. That is a fact which can be backed up through research and by statistics. An opinion is more of an attitude an evaluative judgment based on how you perceive the facts. People who get AIDS deserve what they get. Can you document this statement? There are many problems with this statement. One, of course, is the issue of one human being determining whether another deserves to live or die. Plus, there's the question of those who contract AIDS through unavoidable means, such as a blood transfusion, or babies who are born with AIDS. Do they deserve such a fate? Statements of this sort, then, are opinions. They are not able to be proved. Certain kinds of resource materials will almost always contain more opinion than fact. For example, editorials are meant to convince rather than inform the reader. An editorial in favor of banning billboards might make statements like, billboards are unsightly eyesores which do nothing but pollute the scenery. However, a newspaper article on the same subject would make more factual statements, like, there are more than 52 billboards in the downtown area of this city. That statement is not only verifiable, it allows readers to draw their own conclusions. Another kind of resource that usually contains more opinion than fact is the book and movie review. These articles are meant to express the writer's reaction to a given book or film. But this doesn't mean the information you read in a review is not worth using. For example, if you're writing a paper on Glenn Close and your thesis is, Glenn Close is considered one of the finest actresses of our time. Naturally, movie reviews would be the kind of supporting material that will back up your statement. The written materials you read in your research may contain a mix of both fact and opinion. Because an article contains some opinion doesn't mean the source isn't reliable. It does mean, however, that you should distinguish between the two kinds of statements, fact and opinion, so that you don't mistakenly write down the author's opinion as if it were fact. Take, for example, this article on daycare. The article states many facts which lead you to conclude that it is difficult to find quality daycare for children. 
First, there is the fact that many daycare centers have long waiting lists and can't care for every child who needs it. Secondly, there is the fact that only a portion of daycare facilities actually meet their state licensing requirements. However, the same article quotes a mother who says that the federal government doesn't care about children. Fact or opinion? Obviously, this is the mother's opinion. The government may not support current child care legislation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the government doesn't care about children. This leads us to our next consideration when gathering information for a research paper. How to avoid leaping to incorrect conclusions. Whenever you read something, you draw inferences from the statements that are made. We do this in our everyday lives as well. For example, what can you infer about this picture? Is this a stereo repairman? He could be, but in his white shirt and tie, he doesn't exactly look like a repairman. Is he just listening to music? Perhaps. But if he is listening to music, why is he listening with only one earphone instead of two? The point is, we don't have enough information from this picture to understand what's really going on. The fact is, this man is using wiretap gear to listen to a phone conversation. Without more information about this picture, such as what the earphones are connected to, or what this man does for a living, we cannot draw the proper conclusions. Likewise, when you're reading through your research, you need to be sure you don't draw incorrect inferences from the information you read. This book on Cuba, for example, states that there are many gambling casinos in Cuba. In another source, you may read that Cuba has several sandy beaches perfect for swimming. You could conclude from all this that Cuba is a major tourist spot. However, Cuba's casinos were thriving in the 1950s and are closed today. And because Fidel Castro closed Cuba's doors to tourists, those sandy beaches are not being used for recreation by Americans. The book which made those statements was written more than 30 years ago. The inference that Cuba is a major tourist spot is incorrect. For a more recent example, you can look at the changes in Germany with the removal of the Berlin Wall. If you were to use a book on Germany written in 1988, for example, it would describe a very different country from what we know today. It would be easy to draw incorrect inferences from this source. To safeguard against errors such as this, always ask yourself whether you have enough information to support your inference, and whether new or more recent information could alter your perception of the facts. Finally, the last but by no means the least important thing you need to consider when reading through your research is what is the point of the article or book? Being able to pick out the central idea in any source is crucial to the research process. Just as your thesis statement is the main point that you raise in your paper, remember that every source you read also contains a thesis statement. Although the piece may raise several issues, they should all support the main idea. Let's look at the following article. Perhaps you hope to become a better parent or to work a little harder toward that promotion you think you deserve. Or maybe you'd like to take off the extra 20 pounds you've been carrying around for a little too long. Visualizing what you'd like to become and also what you don't want to be may help you attain your goals. In a recent study, students created vivid images of themselves, like one who thought of becoming a successful Southern California lawyer with her own swimming pool, and another who imagined working at a mindless job and living in a rat-infested apartment. The students then worked on difficult tasks, such as doing math problems mentally. Students who had imagined future success outperformed those who imagined failure. What's the main point of this article? Here's some possibilities. One, if you want to lose weight, you might have a hard time doing math problems. Two, students imagine themselves becoming everything from successful lawyers to poverty-stricken failures. Or three, imagining whether you'll be successful in life can help you be successful at small tasks that you attempt. The correct answer is three. The first statement, if you want to lose weight, you might have a hard time doing math problems, is a faulty inference. 
The article mentions wanting to lose weight, but that doesn't make people fail at math tests. The second statement about how students imagine themselves is one of the points made in the article, but it's not the main point. The article isn't about how many different ways students envision their futures. If it had been, the article would have gone into much greater detail about the various fantasies students have, from becoming a movie star to joining the Peace Corps. The article is about how envisioning your future affects success. Statement number three. It is easy to get sidetracked when reading an article and miss the point. Sometimes a sentence can trigger a thought and you lose the original idea. Maybe you really want to lose weight, for example. So the sentence in the article about dieting catches your attention. To avoid getting sidetracked, go back and skim the source after you've finished reading it once. As you skim, try to get an overview of the whole piece. Then, in one sentence, sum up the thesis of the article or book and write it in your notes. Writing it down will help crystallize your thoughts. So these are the basic rules of note-taking. Judge the quality of your source by its relevance, recency, and ranking. Distinguish factual statements from opinion. Avoid jumping to conclusions. And be sure you can identify the main idea in each of the sources you read. And remember that good note-taking will help you avoid unintentional plagiarism. If all this seems a little overwhelming, just remember you already do this naturally in your everyday life. You wouldn't quote old statistics on your favorite team. You'd be sure to find the most recent information available. And if you're trying out a new recipe, you wouldn't jump to the conclusion that this is going to be the best dessert recipe ever until you've tasted the results and have more information. So it is with your research. Once you start to apply these principles, you'll realize it's really a question of common sense and not nearly as overwhelming as it first might have seemed.